What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Fireside Giants. I'm your host, Anthony Rovardo, joined by my co-host, Alex Wilson. The Giants are on their bye week. Alex just perfectly imitated me. That was a really job well done. But you know what? Joe Shane did not imitate a good general manager this week. I was very upset with a lot of the things that Joe Shane said at his bye week press conference. It's been a couple of days. We've had time to decompress, to not be too reactionary, but... I don't know. Temper's still running. I'm a little bit angry anyway. How can you not be? The Giants are 2-8. and eight. They just lost to the Panthers. They are the worst team in football right now by pretty much every single metric. So, yeah, there is a lot to discuss from Joe Shane's press conference. There's a lot to say. We're going to get angry. We might just let off some curse words. Who knows? Stay tuned. We'll see. But right now, I think that it's important that we do sit down and react to these press conference quotes, Alex, because... Joe Shane talked about everything. He talked about the coaching, he talked about his job security, and of course he talked about the quarterback. And he also said that the Giants are not far off from being a good football team, which I think is highly debatable. But right now when we're looking at the status of the New York Giants, I think it's really hard to feel confident in many of the messages that Joe Shane was pushing at this press conference. And before you guys get angry, I understand there's certain things that he can and can't say. I get that it's a politics game, right? He can't just be completely honest 100% of the time. Part of his job as the GM is to lie to the media. I get that. However, the certain ways in which he lies rub me the wrong way. And I'll explain more of that once we dive into some more of these specific quotes. But Alex, how are you feeling today, my friend? I know you were a little under the weather yesterday. We are so happy to have you back and feeling healthy. I'm out here in California in case you guys are wondering about the change of scenery behind me. I'm enjoying the bye week, man. Vacation time. It's a good time right now. Don't have to worry about the New York Giants losing this Sunday. But Alex, how are you doing today, my friend? And how are you feeling about Joe Shane's bye week press conference? I'm doing good. A lot better than yesterday, a little under the weather, but back at it today. Now, God, um, I wanted to do this episode yesterday to get get you guys a little bit more of an instant reaction to everything, but, you know, had to take that day uh, to recover so I could give you my full attention and full energy because, guys, that shit pissed me off. That whole thing pissed me off. And the reason is, I get that general managers are going to lie. I get we're used to this like lying, BS, and you want to know something, Anthony, you know what GMs lie the most? Losing GMs. Losing general managers lie the most. Because winning GMs have nothing to lie about. We're doing well. Our our roster is strong. We're reinforcing things. We're, We're, you know, doing this, doing that. Like, they have no reason to lie. But then you have the Dave Gettleman to the world, and it's seen, and dude, when I tell you, watching that Je- that Joe Shane press conference gave me flashbacks to Dave Gettleman's press conferences because they sounded exactly the same. We're close to where we want to be. We have the people in place. We had a strong class. We have this. We had a free. It's all the same bullshit we've been hearing for years. And we're just hearing it from a different mouth now. You know what I mean? A much younger and modern Joe Shane who spruced up the whole draft board and made it all electronic, yet... This dude can't put together a competent roster despite the fact they invested in new screens and a couple more keyboards and maybe taking the draft stuff out of a big notebook that only Dave Gilman had access to. You know, (laughs) he's he's putting it all on the the blackboard, and obviously this is a good thing for the modernizing of the organization for whoever is running this team long term, but it hasn't equated to success. Modernizing this team has not resulted in success. Now – one of the things that really pissed me off the most that what Joe Shane said is that we are close to being a competent, good, successful team. We're close. That was the biggest lie that I heard. And let me just get one thing out of the road. Every single team is one elite quarterback away from being great, right? Or even competent, right? But getting an elite quarterback is the most difficult thing that you can do. Assuming that we are close, like let's just say that the Giants needed an elite quarterback – the fact that you don't have one means that you are light years away from the Chiefs, light years away from the Bills, light years away from teams that have competency at very least at the quarterback position. The Giants need an elite quarterback to be a successful organization, a successful team. And we're going into a class that does not have one of those top tier prospects, right? We're hoping we can maximize Camel. We're hoping we can maximize Shadur Sanders. We are praying. We're instilling hope because we have a top draft pick. That's all we can do as Giants fans, right? But Joe Shane is out here just spreading blatant lies. And he's burying himself in them. Like, he is buried in lies and losses. That's the title of my of my article yesterday. Giants general manager has buried himself in lies and losses. 2-8, and 0-6 in the division. Let's talk about how it's not just the quarterback position, right? The Giants, yeah, we need an elite quarterback. Every one of their moms knows this. 
But how about the lack of talent in the secondary? How about the lack of their ability to stop the run? How about their lack of ability to develop young receivers like Jalen Hyatt, for example? How about the fact they're about to lose Aziz Ojolari and Darius Slayton in free agency, most likely? You know, how about the fact that we are not maximizing our top talent? Evan Neal's a bust. Kayvon Thibodeau's injured and inconsistent. You know, Dante Banks is inconsistent and in, in obviously having troubles with his confidence right now. Malik Neighbors can't, doesn't even want to, doesn't even look like he's giving a half effort anymore because he knows Daniel Jones is not going to hit him 10 yards over his head in the last game in, in that first drive. I mean, that was Daniel Jones to a T, man. Like, how can anyone put in maximum effort when they know the quarterback's going to lose them football games and their defense can't stop the run? Right? Shane Bowen was brought here to stop the run, and the Giants have one of the, wor- the worst run defenses in football. So, you know, let's assume that the Giants are not just a quarterback away uh, from being a competent NFL team. They are a secondary away. They're an interior uh, defense away. They are a couple receivers away. They're an offensive line depth uh, away. They're a starting guard away. Like, they have so many holes, which just goes to show the the roundabout kind of conclusion I'm trying to get at here is that the Giants are not even remotely close. And Joe Shane is out here spewing blatant lies. And I know he has to lie, but don't – we're not stupid. Like, don't, that's just disrespectful at that point. Disrespecting us, in my opinion. Well, we're not stupid, but can't, we can't speak for everybody. Uh, but, okay. So I want to unpack what you're saying here, because I don't disagree with you. However, I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate here, Alex. Because I've said this before, that the Giants are a quarterback away from being decent. But I think there's a big difference between the Giants not being far off, the general manager saying we are not far off, and the Giants not being far off from winning a couple of extra games, right? Like I said last year, they won six games. Had they had a different quarterback versus the Jets, versus the Rams, versus the Bills, those three games they could have won with a better quarterback. They would have been a nine-win team. They would have once again been a wild card team. Those are true statements in my opinion. It's also true that if the Giants had a better quarterback, they probably beat the Commanders in Week 2. There's a good chance they beat the Bengals. Maybe they even beat the Cowboys. Sure, all of these things are true. However, finding a competent quarterback is the most difficult task in sports, not just in the NFL, but arguably in all of sports, at least in the United States, of all of the big major sports leagues, to find a franchise quarterback, that's the toughest piece of any roster construction in these major sports leagues. So to say we are not far off, well, that's not true, because it's not as easy as plugging in any quarterback. Maybe the Panthers felt like they were just a quarterback away when they drafted Bryce Young. And Bryce Young hasn't panned out. So guess what? They are more than just a quarterback away. And this is my thing, though, Alex. Sure, we're not far off. Yeah, we're a quarterback away from winning some of these games. But we are not a quarterback away from being a Super Bowl contender. My argument last year wasn't, man, if the Giants had a different quarterback, maybe they could have won the Super Bowl. It was, maybe they could have squeaked into a wild card spot. That's not the goal for a general manager. At least it shouldn't be. Joe Shane's goal shouldn't be to get a quarterback so that they can be competing for wild card spots. I want to see this team competing to win the division every year, to be a divisional playoff team, maybe even push for a first round bye. Do you understand how far away the New York Giants are from that? Look at the Detroit Lions team that's leading the NFC right now. Stack up every single position group that the Detroit Lions have against what the New York Giants have. The Lions wash them in every single position group. Wide receiver, offensive line, secondary, defensive line, everywhere all across the board, obviously quarterback, everywhere across the board, the Detroit Lions are a better football team. So the Giants are not far off from making the playoffs possibly. That's true. But they are very far off from being competitive with teams like Detroit, like even Philadelphia right now. They're surging. They're 7-2. and two. Like even Washington right now surging at 7-2. and two. The Giants are very far away from those teams. And I don't want to hear... Oh, the commanders felt like they were more than a quarterback away, and then they got Jaden Daniels. They rebuilt their entire roster this offseason around Jaden Daniels. They added so much talent to both sides of the ball. They spent big. They just added Marshawn Lattimore at the deadline. They are not they are not the same caliber of roster that the New York Giants have right now. They weren't and they still are not into the season. So I'm just so annoyed by the this, the way this team... I think you actually said it best, Alex. It sounds like Dave Gettleman all over again. We heard this kind of crap from Gettleman. We're very close. We believe in our plan. We trust the process. Joe Shane hasn't given us any real reason to trust the process. And guys, don't highlight the 2024 draft class for me because... Let, here's the thing about this draft class. 
A plus draft class. I'll be the first one to tell you. Excellent draft class. But you know what that tells me? The fact that this draft class has had this many players make an immediate impact in, in this season, that tells me that this roster is terrible. Why do you have five rookies starting at key positions and those five rookies are pretty much your best players this season? That tells you that the Giants had an awful roster going into the season. That's what that tells you. The fact that Xavier McKinney left and, oh, but Tyler Newbin's been great. Yeah, but that's because you have a rookie playing 99% of snaps. That's not normal, and that's not okay for a rookie to be playing 99% of the team's defensive snaps. That highlights what a mistake the Giants made in free agency and how bad this roster is constructed. So I don't, I don't, I fundamentally disagree with the statement that the New York Giants are not far off. They are very far away from being a top contending team. If you want to settle for average, for mediocrity, sure, the Giants aren't far away from that. They get a decent quarterback, and yeah, they are a mediocre team. I'm not happy with mediocrity, Alex. I want this team to win playoff games, not one playoff game and then get trampled by a division rival in the divisional round, you know, beat the shitty Minnesota Vikings with a historically bad secondary, okay, and then get trampled the next week by Philly. That's not good enough for me. I want a team that wins in Minnesota, then wins in Philadelphia and makes it to the conference championship game. This team is so far away from that. No matter what they did in 2022, no matter how good they looked down the final stretch of that season, great convincing win against the shitty Colts. Awesome. Awesome that he had a great performance against the Vikings in the wild card round. Love to see that. But we knew that that team was not going to win a Super Bowl. That was impossible for that roster. And it still is. And it's been two years of rebuilding, retooling, adding talent, and signing players to massive extensions that so far the Daniel Jones one has not panned out. That was a crucial mistake. So to say that this team is not far off from competing, it's a half truth because they're not far off from being a, a potential wild card team. But if you want to talk about a legitimate championship roster, we are years away from seeing that happen and no quarterback is stepping in and making the New York Giants immediately Super Bowl contenders. I think one of the points you made really uh, hit hard, and the one that I think really stood out to me was that this rookie class, how much of them are playing significant snaps. They walked into this season with a fourth-round tight end starting, a fourth-round rookie tight end starting, a fifth-round rookie running back in Tyron Tracy, who's been excellent, by the way, but basically was inserted into the equation as, like, you you know, beats Devin Singletary. Like, that should not be the case. Um, Andrew Phillips, a third-round rookie cornerback who's been excellent, but the only reason that he was starting is because we didn't have anybody else. Nobody else. Like, they were like, either he, st he sucks and we he struggles as a rookie, or we get lucky and he plays excellent. They got so lucky that he's been as good as he is, and the scouting was excellent there. So I'm happy about that, but they had no choice to, to play him because they had nobody else, right? Um, like you said, Tyler Newbin, in a, in a perfect world, you, you, you draft these guys, like, kind of like with the, with the Philadelphia Eagles and with Cooper DeGean. Like, he's, he wasn't starting immediately, right? Like, they, they eased him in. They used him when they needed to. The Giants had no choice, right? Like, this, this roster is extremely thin. They have rookies playing at key positions across the board. <clears throat> I mean, even for Malik Neighbors, wouldn't you have loved to have, like, a legitimate receiver and then add Malik Neighbors, kind of like what the Vikings did with Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison? Like, wouldn't you love to have another top receiver in addition to Neighbors? Like, take that pressure off of him. You know, make sure he doesn't have to be the guy that, like, it all falls on his shoulders to make this offense go. Um, he's lucky that Tracy's been so good. And, you know, I think that Wandale would be a lot better if he had a quarterback who actually threw him the freaking ball. Like, that might help. Jalen Hyatt had more targets last week in, like, a 30-second span than he did in the previous nine games before that. So, you know, <laughs> when it comes to the Giants and Joe Shane and, and, and this press conference, it was the same old. You know what I mean? It was the same old BS we've been hearing for 10 years. 10 years, guys. That's how long it's been. 10 years in one playoff appearance. A real playoff win to show for it, right? I know we lost to the Packers a couple years back uh, with OBJ on the team and, and you know, the, the, the boat, the boat uh, picture and all that stuff. So, you know, looking at this roster now, though, and where the Giants go, look, they've built a solid foundation with this rookie class, but the rookie classes before that are basically non-factors, right? Evan Neal's been horrible. Like, where are those guys? Where, where, where are the rookies? Where are the developmental pieces here? Wait, Ron, Wandale's been okay, but on our offensive line, think about what we have there. We have Greg Van Roten, Jermaine Illuminor, JMS, who's been okay, getting better, but okay. We have John Running and Andrew Thomas. We have one guy on that line that was drafted and plugged in and is even like holding his own at times. Jamis is inconsistent still. Um, 
in the secondary. DeAndre Banks has been bad this season. Tyler Newbin's been good in the run, struggling in the past. You know, teams are just running the football against us, and they don't really have to throw the ball downfield, right? They don't, they don't need to do it to beat us. <coughs> Excuse me. And then Cordell Flott's been extremely injury-prone and inconsistent. Um, you know, who else do we even have there? I mean, Andrew Phillips, yeah, like the rookie class. Dane Belton's been, been like, terrible. Dane Belton's not even like a, a Marcus McKethon's not team. on this team. Josh oh, yeah, is unplayable. Darian Beavers is not on this team anymore. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, like you you look across the board. Michael McFadden's, we've gotten decent value out of, but most, the majority of the draft picks over the last three years have been poor to bad to non-factors to, you know, inconsistent. Um, you know, this past rookie class has, has been a saving grace. I mean, without this rookie class, Anthony... I, I don't I can't sit here and tell you that I have any faith in this in this front office. Like even now I, I barely do. Without this rookie class, I think they'd be gone. Like this team would be yeah. the worst in football and it wouldn't even be relatively close. Mm-hmm. And this rookie class saved Joe Shane's job, which we said several weeks ago. This was a job saving draft class. However, once again, I'm gonna make this point. This rookie draft class being this good highlights what a terrible job he's done constructing the roster with veteran in house and free agency talent. Because they drafted Newbin in the second round. Why? They had to. Because they didn't have a starting safety going into the draft. Because Xavier McKinney walked away in free agency. They drafted Tyrone Tracy. Why? Because all they had was Devin Singletary and Eric Gray, who they don't believe in. Another missed draft pick. So they had to draft a running back. Why did they sign, uh, or why did they draft Theo Johnson? Darren Waller retired, and they didn't address it in free agency. They had to draft a tight end. Go across all the same thing that you mentioned with Drew Phillips. They didn't have a starting nickel cornerback. They had to take him. Drafting for need compromises your roster. The Giants are very lucky that they hit on these draft picks this year, and they had an excellent draft class. Awesome job done by the scouting department, but it highlights what a poor job this roster or Joe Shane has done constructing this roster with established talent because there is no established talent. It's all young, rising, first year players, second year players. And you know what's the thing about these guys, Alex? These rookies, as great as they are right now, who's to say they don't regress next year? Who's to say one or two of them don't get injured and miss next season? Then what's up with your young nucleus of talent that you're building around? Well, some of it's gone then. So, I, I just, again, fundamentally disagree with the notion that the Giants are not far off. I love this rookie draft class, but the success of this draft class highlights the shortcomings of the rest of this roster. And, Alex, let's talk about the quarterback position. We know Joe Shane is a dead man, or I mean, sorry, we know that Daniel Jones is a dead man walking. He will not be starting after the bye week. I think we all know that that's the truth. Maybe they shock us and he does play. If so, I'm going to go over to MetLife Stadium and I'm going to throw a riot. I'm going to lead an absolute riot and try to burn down that stadium. Just kidding. Please don't arrest me, somebody. But I cannot watch another second of Daniel Jones, and I don't think we're going to. But here's my thing. Joe Shane was asked in the offseason, looking back on it, would you have done anything differently at the quarterback possession? He said no. Now, obviously, that created a lot of spark on Twitter. I was pissed off by that statement. You mentioned on Twitter, Alex, that... Joe Shane was clearly lying through his teeth, and he was, but I still don't like that answer. He could have said, well, you know what, maybe I should reevaluate the way that I did things in the offseason at the quarterback position. That's all he needed to say. I didn't ask for him to throw Daniel Jones under the bus. I didn't say, oh, just go ahead and admit that you made a mistake. No, just admit that you could have done a little bit more work. That's all I wanted to hear. Give us a window of insight and tell us that you are holding yourself accountable for your mistakes. And here's my thing, though, Alex. A lot of people responded to me and were like, well, what did you want him to do differently at the quarterback position? What could he have possibly done? Guys, there are seven rounds in the NFL draft. The Giants did not take a single quarterback. We have made this point so many times. Brian Dable was brought here to develop a young quarterback into a franchise quarterback. The Giants haven't even given him an an opportunity to do that at any point that he's been here. And I'm not saying that taking a fifth round pick on a guy like Spencer Rattler would have changed the season. Absolutely not. But you know what it would have done, Alex? It would have given the Giants an option to turn to and to push Daniel Jones in practice and on the, the regular season field. Give him, give this roster somebody to push the starting quarterback that you don't believe in. The Giants tried all offseason to replace him. They failed to replace him. But he has had zero competition, and he has had all the privilege in the world to just keep going out there and playing bad football because the Giants didn't give their, their coaching staff a realistic option to turn to if Daniel Jones played poorly. You're going to turn to Drew Locke? He's not any good. 
Why didn't the Giants take a rookie in the middle of the rounds just to push Daniel Jones and give you some pressure to apply to him? That's what they should have done. And we said this at the time, Alex. We said, at least throw a dart on the board in the middle rounds so you have somebody who can push Daniel Jones and that you can turn to if Daniel Jones sucks again this year. Well, he sucks and they don't have anybody to turn to. One year, $5 million deal for another sucky quarterback and Drew Locke. What a solution. So you know what? Joe Shane, I get it. He doesn't want to admit that he's wrong, but he should have at least hinted to the fact that he needs to reevaluate the way that he decided to approach the quarterback position. Yeah, I mean, like like you said, I mean, somebody asked him, do you think, do you regret it? And he said no, and another lie, right? Like, I, again, I feel disrespected. He thinks that we're that stupid. You know what I mean? That he thinks that we're that dumb that we're going to fall for the generic bullshit lies. And it makes me not like him, you know, to be quite honest with you. Um, you know, he could easily just say something like this. Like, let, let's come up with a couple alternatives to just blatantly lying and be like, you know what, maybe, like, if, if things were different, if we knew what we knew now, maybe we would have gone and maybe would have, we would have restructured, maybe we would have uh, brought on another, some more support, maybe we would have done something differently, I don't know, I can't play revisionist history. Like, that's a, that's a fine alternative, because at least you acknowledge the fact that, yeah, like, the situation unfolded not the way you wanted, but you don't have to blatantly lie to us to say, no, like, we don't regret what we did, despite the fact you're 2-8, and 0-6, oh Daniel Jones is literally a dog of freaking dog shit, a bag of dog shit right now, and let's say, let's say when it comes to uh, claiming that we are not far off. I know he has to say that vague BS, but you know he doesn't have to say stuff like that because we also know it's lying, and I also feel disrespected by it. And, you know, alternative could be something like I don't know. We know that we have pieces that we really love here. We think that we can retool, reset, add some foundational talent next year's draft, see if we can upgrade some positions and put us, put ourselves in a chance to be competitive. Right now, we're not playing well enough. We're not playing at a competitive level, and that has to change. And that's our responsibility. That's fine. That's a great answer. You know what I mean? It's a good alternative. So everyone's saying in the comments right now, well, what was he supposed to say? I just gave you two good alternatives that he could say that I would have been happy with. You know, I don't know why. Because he didn't lie to our faces and he didn't make us feel like he's the enemy and that he's the victim of his own decisions. You know what I mean? Like he is acting like he's the victim. No, I don't regret it. Oh, uh, we're not that far off. Not only are you lying and we know you're lying. But it makes you look bad, man, because we know you're you're just talking shit. You're just talking out of your ass, and we're supposed to buy these goods. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's like going to the store, and someone gives you a sample, and you're like, this tastes like shit. Why would I buy that? You know what I mean? Like, why would you buy it? Because it what is coming out of this dude's mouth is nonsense. And I want to like him. You know what I mean? Like, I think he's a decent guy. Same with Daniel Jones, Anthony. Decent guy, great work ethic, horrible results. Is this what the Giants are? Great work ethic. Here they're nine to five, or when they're six to nine, or whatever. You know what I mean? We're we're there early, we leave late, but we still suck. You know, it can't just be the same bullshit all the time where you 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 show this elite work ethic, you're all over, you're flying to Notre Dame, you're flying to Miami, you're going to Colorado's practice, yet we can't hit on a draft pick? You know what I mean? We can't we can't hit on a free agent, we can't build a competent roster, we can't compete against the Panthers. And you want me to sit here and buy the shit you're selling me? No way. I'm done with it. I'm done with it, Anthony. And we called it before this season started. If they lose the first couple games, if they go on a, on a stretch here where they're starting to lose and they're starting to show what we think they are, it's going to get ugly fast. And exactly what we predicted happened. Because we know, we've, we've already been through this, guys. Like, I know everyone watching this episode, everyone watching Fireside Giants this whole season, we have lived through the last six years together. You know, you and I, like, you and me, Anthony, you and me, viewer, watcher, we have both broke down this team, watched this crap, and we've seen this story before where we've instilled faith in people that do not curate results. We've instilled faith in a quarterback who is going to be mid forever, forever. He has too many weaknesses that cannot be fixed. The deal is the deed is done. I hope to God and, and Anthony, don't even get me started on if they do not bench him, right? If they do not bench him, I am entirely done with Joe Shane and Brian Dable, entirely done, because there is no more saving face. Daniel Jones can be their punching bag as much as they want, can be the guy that takes all the shit for them, but at some point, they gotta take it to the chin and hold some responsibility and be accountable for their actions, because right now, this is their roster. I can't blame Dave Gettleman anymore. Joe Shane gave Daniel Jones a contract. This entire foundation of this team is different. Everybody is different except for Daniel Jones and Darius Slayton. Those are the only two leftover pieces, maybe Casey Kreider too. Like, this is like, <laughs> what are we doing here, man? Like, we are talking about the same, we're talking about the same exact scenario unfolding before our eyes with two totally separate GMs, right? 
they have to be, they got to grow some balls, man. They got to make the tough decisions. I know they let Saquon go. I know that was a tough decision. That was the, the one sign of like, okay, Joe Shane has some balls, right? But he's got to go out there and put it on the line for a quarterback. His entire job is on the line this upcoming draft because they have to get the right quarterback. They have to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to get the guy that they think is going to be a star at the NFL level, right? I don't know if that's, it's either Sanders or Cam Ward. There is no, there was no in between. Right? It's one of those two guys, objectively. Nussmeyer, I like him, but he's far from being ready for the NFL, in my opinion. Um, any Jackson Dart, far from being NFL ready. I think there are two players, and it's Sanders and it's Cam Ward, and I, you know my preference is, is, is Ward. That's just my take. That's how I feel. It's totally fun if you disagree. We're going to find out one day anyway. I just hope to God, whether it's Sanders or Ward, the Giants pick, that they get it right. Because they cannot afford it. And by the way, I don't know if you heard that whole thing with Deion Sanders saying that he's going to step in and force behind the scenes, not publicly, whoever drafts his son. If he doesn't like where he goes, he's going to force them to trade him. I don't know why you would go into that situation if you're the Giants and, and feel comfortable. You know, if they start losing and the roster doesn't start developing, Deion Sanders is going to step in and force this t force the team to trade his son. You know what I mean? Like, you, who wants that as a problem? He just said it on fucking television. Publicly to everybody, I'm going to force it behind the scenes. I'm not going to make it public, but I'm, I'm going to do it behind the scenes. Why on earth would you get yourself wrapped up in that problem? Because you are the New York Giants. If you lose and you struggle and the roster is not good, you are going to run into that problem. Do you really want to run into that problem? We're going to be the biggest laughing stock in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the league, and we already are. You know what I mean? Like that is a big red flag to me. I don't want someone's dad making decisions for this him. Is, the NFL. This is a grown man. Talk. This is so. I know, but it's pissing me off because he's coming out and saying public shit like this. But like, that's a huge red flag to me, man. In the New York media market, you can't have that stuff. You can't have that stuff. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you, but I, I think a lot of that right now is rumors and speculation. And I think we can have a more thorough conversation about that closer into the off season. And it's also, it's predicated on whether or not the giants fire Brian Dable, which is why I wanted to interject here, Alex, and just bring up, there was a very interesting moment during Joe Shane's press conference where he was asked about the quality of talent on the roster. And he was asked whether or not he thinks he's put a good enough product on the field. And he said, yes, he does think that he put a good enough roster out there. First of all, what the fuck? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Seriously? You think this roster is good enough, Joe Shane? And then this is the part that really got me, Alex. After he said that, he was like, yeah, I think this roster is good enough. Somebody logically then asked him, if the roster is good enough and the team is still 2-8, and eight, what's the problem? Is it coaching? And he didn't really defend Brian Dable. I don't know if you caught that, Alex. He didn't really say, oh, Dable's done a good job. He didn't say anything like that. He said, we're evaluating everything, and we're going to talk with Dable this week. So he didn't give a glowing review of his head coach, who he's apparently best buddies with. I, and again, I said it on an episode a couple days ago, Alex. It's fucked up what they've done to Brian Dable. They forced a shitty quarterback upon him, and he's been struggling to get things done. He's done his absolute best. He has tried his hardest. But Joe Shane's greatest error of re-signing that quarterback is what's probably going to get Brian Dable fired at some point. That is not cool. That is really, really messed up. If I were Brian Dable, I would hate Joe Shane at that point. And that's obviously going to lead into the larger discussion, Alex. If the GM can't give that public vote of confidence to the head coach, where do we think the season is heading? Could Brian Dable be on the outs? Could Brian Dable get fired and Joe Shane keeps his job? Is that where we're heading? What is this offseason going to look like? Because honestly, the way that this press conference read to me, and not just read, I watched it, guys. I watched the whole thing from start to finish in the airport. Every single second of it I was listening to, I was locked in. But the way that it sounded to me was Joe Shane felt very confident that he was going to keep his job. But he was asked about his job. He was not asked about Brian Dable's job. And when he was asked about the job that Brian Dable's done, he didn't necessarily sound too thrilled. Could Joe Shane be positioning himself to fire Brian Dable and maintain his job as the general manager? Alex, what do you think about that? Is that a possibility here? And did you also get that sense that Joe Shane didn't sound too thrilled with Brian Dable during his press conference, but sounded more than okay giving himself praise and saying how great of a roster he's put onto the field? I mean, that's a really, like, again, Joe Shane, that press conference was a catastrophe, a absolute catastrophe. Not only did he blatantly lie to all of us and try to make us feel stupid by lying to our faces, but then he threw his head coach under the bus by saying that he felt he gave his he gave them enough talent to work with. You know what I mean? Like that is that is like literally deflecting the blame. 
he literally just blamed the coaching staff because he said, we gave them enough talent, they should be able to build a winning team. You know what I mean? Like, that's that's basically what he said almost verbatim. So, okay. I mean, what do I, what do I feel like is going to happen here? If Joe Shane and Brian Dable have a falling out and then they fire Brian Dable, we are in so much worse shit than we thought. You know what I mean? So much worse shit. Because I'll tell you this right now. Remember what happened when Wink Martindale and Brian Dable had a falling out? Wink Martindale went into Brian Dable's office, cursed, screamed, threw shit, walked out. Half a couple of coaches also got fired. And you want to know what the immediate reaction to that was? The Giants going out to find a defensive coordinator and missing everyone. They lost out on every single top option. Everybody that had any sort of worth said, nah, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. Whatever just happened there, not, not for me. Shane Bowen, was the only reason he took this job is because there was nothing left. You were the only option. It was, a, it, was a, it was a marriage by force. It was a forced marriage is what Shane Bowen and the Giants was. You know what I mean? If Joe Shane and Brian Dale have a falling out, two of the best buddies in, this, in the league, at least what we thought, you know, two of the best buddies, they were a, a combo deal, and they have a falling out, and there's blame game going on here, and, there's some, and he fires him, and Joe Shane stays, and you're a head coach, or you're an OC, or you're a veteran, you're looking to go somewhere. And you're looking at that situation saying to yourself, they were best friends. And he just fired his best friend and after having a falling out. What is he going to do to me? And I'm not even friends with the guy. You know what I mean? Like, what is he going to do? Is he going to throw me under the bus the second he has a chance? Like, think about the image. That's, I think if you fire Brian Dable, you got to fire Joe Shane too. There's no one or the other. You can't fire one of them. And, and you, you have to fire both of them. Because they come as a combo deal. And they came as a combo deal from the Bills. Because that situation is catastrophic if you fire one of them and the other one stays because you're never you're not going to get anyone good and no one's going to want to come here I, I listen i don't necessarily fully agree with you or disagree with you i kind of have mixed opinions on this one i will say though what the giants did last time with dave gettleman being the general manager and being allowed to hire two head coaches or was it three two two head coaches that was a mistake that should have never happened. So actually, I do agree with you. If you're going to fire one, you should probably fire both and bring in a perfect marriage. Similar to what the turnaround the Los Angeles Chargers did this past offseason. They blew it all up and they brought in a package deal with a head coach and a GM. It worked for them. Hasn't worked so far for the Giants. But key difference, they have a franchise quarterback and the Giants don't. So that makes a big, a whole lot of difference in terms of bringing in head coach and general manager candidates. But here's a point that I want to make, Alex, and it's going to be an unpopular opinion, but I need you guys to hear me out. The viewers and the listeners need to hear me out on this one. If the Giants stick with Brian Dable and Joe Shane this offseason, and they draft a quarterback, you cannot be afraid to fire them after one year of that quarterback. And here's what I mean. When the Giants drafted Daniel Jones in 2019, the team still sucked. And what did they do? They made sure that the next head coach that they hired, Joe Judge, was hired with Daniel Jones remaining his quarterback. They said, no matter what, we are married to this quarterback. We're not giving up on him after one year. We're going to just give him a new head coach and hope that that fixes him. That was the biggest mistake that the New York Giants made in the past six years outside of just drafting Daniel Jones. But once they fired Pat Shermer, there should have never been any marriage to Daniel Jones. The next head coach coming in should have been given the autonomy to get rid of Daniel Jones after one year if he wanted to. Even though he was good as a rookie, he had good moments at least. He also turned the ball over a shit ton, but he had his good moments. But the Giants forced Jones upon the next head coach. That was an egregious error. If the Giants do this once again this offseason, draft a head or draft a quarterback in the middle of a shaky regime that's on its last, last leg, and that regime fails, the next regime that steps in needs to have autonomy to take their own quarterback. So even if we draft Cam Ward this offseason, guys, I'm going to be excited. But if they fire Brian Dable the next offseason, I'm probably still looking at quarterbacks in the 2026 NFL draft. And I'm going to be doing work on them on this channel and probably getting excited about the, the idea of trading Cam Ward and taking the next quarterback. Because that's the way that the Giants need to do it. Now, a couple things. People are going to get upset and say, the league has a development problem. Teams give up on quarterbacks too soon. All of that is true. But transitioning a new head coach in to take over with a quarterback that's forced upon them, that's where you get these egregious, 
soul-crushing, franchise-ruining errors like the one that the Giants made in 2019. And let me just put this into perspective, Alex, because I mentioned the turnaround that the Chargers had when they hired Jim Harbaugh and Joe Hortiz this past offseason with Justin Herbert already established. Imagine this. Dave Gettleman absolutely loved Justin Herbert. He went back to school in 2019. The Giants pivoted. They took Daniel Jones. They then picked fourth the next year. I love Andrew Thomas, but guys, I would definitely take Justin Herbert over Andrew Thomas. That's where I'm at with it. Had they not been married to the mediocre rookie season that Daniel Jones had, they could have still taken Justin Herbert, and Dave Gettleman probably still loved him a year later. So that's my point. Don't be married to the quarterback if you reboot this offseason, because the following year, if you fire the head coach all over again, let the new head coach have autonomy, carte blanche, do whatever he wants to make this team as good as possible. Don't force players onto new regimes. That's how you really ruin your franchise. That's what happened to the New York Giants, in my opinion. So go the Cardinals route. If you draft the quarterback, even if he shows promise as a rookie, but you have the number one pick the next year and you're hiring a new GM, a new head coach, let them do whatever they want and take another quarterback. That's that's my final piece on the offseason. Again, that's going to be a larger discussion once we get way down the road. That's looking way ahead, but I just had to get that out there because I can't stomach the, the idea of the Giants marrying themselves to a quarterback again. Just It's got to be on a year-by-year basis. That's how it's got to be, especially when your regime is failing and on the hot seat. But we'll see how it goes. Again, there was a lot to unpack in that Joe Shane press conference. There's probably more that we could keep unpacking, and we will continue to do so throughout the week. But it's going to be an interesting week, the bye week. The Giants, they're going to be practicing soon enough. In a couple of days, who's taking those first-team quarterback reps? I can't wait to see it. Is it going to be all three of the quarterbacks? Is Daniel Jones just going to be put off to the sideline? Like I said, if Daniel Jones drops a weight on his foot and needs to have foot surgery for a broken toe, and he can't pass that physical in March... The Giants are screwed. So not only can he not play on Sundays, he can't play on Wednesdays, he can't play on Tuesdays, he can't even practice with this team because of that injury clause if the Giants are going to factor it into the equation. So once he's out of the lineup, he's inactive. He's done. He's done done. He needs to go find a new team in the offseason. So, but again, it'll be interesting to see if it does become a battle between Drew Locke and Tommy DeVito. You guys know where I stand. But at the same time, I really want whoever's going to lose us games. I'm at that point now. I want to get that quarterback. I want to tank. I don't really want to tank. Like, I don't want to see this team pull away from potential wins, but losing is in the best interest of this New York Giants football team right now. I think we all need to acknowledge that and just hope that we don't get shafted out of a draft pick like we did last year. Alex, any closing thoughts on Joe Shane's press conference or anything that I just said? Um, I mean, next time I see Daniel Jones, I want to see him hitchhiking to Estonia. That's how done I am. They put him on, talk about put him on the sidelines, keep him away from the freaking facilities. Keep him away. The bad omen, bad juju man cannot have this dude anywhere near this team anymore. He has got to be put to bed. Uh, take behind the barn and just put him down. <laughs> Good old dog that he was. <laughs> like, it's, it's, I'm so freaking done, man. Obviously, I don't want him put behind the barn. I think he should be just very peacefully released and caught and never seen again for a football field anywhere near. Until Unless he's playing for another team. In fact, I pray to God he goes to another team that we have to play one day because Pretty much an automatic win for us. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of how I feel at this point. But uh, listen, like I, th- losing is in the best interest of this team. I've said it many times over the last week or so, two weeks even. Um, and you're you're I'll, I'll hit on this very very quickly. Your concept that we should draft the quarterback. You know, if this one doesn't pan out, like I'm of the proponent, Anthony, that this team's success rate hitting on first round picks is pretty much zero. Like they've barely hit on anybody. You might as well keep, except for neighbors, like you might as well just keep taking quarterbacks until you find one. You know what I mean? You might as well keep, especially if you have a top five pick, you might as well just keep taking quarterbacks until you find a star. You know, because like you're better off doing that because this team is so bad. The development is so bad. So much of our first round picks have been gone to waste. You might as well just keep taking shots at the most important position until you find that guy and then you can reallocate your first round picks back to actually building a roster because at this point like what's the point you know what we're going to keep adding first round talent just to ruin them like Kayvon's not reached his potential in my opinion he's been fine at times but I think we can we can comfortably say like there's more there that hasn't been extracted uh Evan Neal's absolute bust I mean Deontay Banks like we don't know yet. It's it's still too early to call, but I, I do think that right now we're not getting near enough value from him. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot going on with this team that I just uh, – I think that, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe you just keep taking swings until you find that guy. But 
obviously easier said than done. Hopefully we just take one swing and we find that guy. Hopefully we take a swing on Sanders or Ward and they end up becoming the savior for this Giants team. Uh, that's where I currently stand. That's where I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to look at anything else until uh, until that time. But one thing is for sure, I think the Giants know they have to lose. I don't think they're going to lose on purpose, but I think putting in Drew Locke or Tommy DeVito, we're not going to win. You know what I mean? Like, I know Tommy DeVito, like, won us a couple games, but I think that was an anomaly. I think that was a miracle. It was a fluke. I think that he holds onto the ball too much. I think that this he's, you know, teams know how to stop him. All you have to do is just drop extra guys in coverage, and he won't throw it. Like, he will just run around back there. Drew Locke will throw interceptions. He will turn it over. Um, look, Giants could sneak out a win against Dallas or the Saints. They could do that. That will be catastrophic to us. I, I just don't yes, know. Yes, I, I, okay. I just want to say the Tommy DeVito thing, you're right. He held on to the ball too long the last year. That was last year. If you don't remember, he didn't have a training camp last year. He had a training camp this offseason. I wouldn't put it past him to be a better player this year than he was last year. I, I think that he could have made strides in his game and improved. So, But I don't know. Again, if he has made strides in his game and he is a better quarterback, we probably shouldn't put him on the field because then we're going to win those games versus the Saints and versus the Cowboys and stuff. And then we're going to lose our draft pick. So I'm with you, though. I hope they take one swing at the quarterback, so and it's the swing that sets us for the next 20 years like it was with Eli Manning in 2004. I pray to God. Dude, that would be so – if we brought in Tommy DeVito again and he won us football games – Think about how sad that would be and how much of an indication it would be that Joe Shane and Brian Dable don't know what the fuck they're doing. You know what I mean? If they would have brought in Tommy DeVito again, he won them football games. Think okay, about but, that, though. But here's think the thing, about though. how much of an indication of like how lost they actually are if that were to happen again. But I get that your point and your perspective. But for Brian Dable, who just got the lack of a glowing review from Joe Shane— he might go out there and say, I need to put Tommy DeVito in because I need to win games. Otherwise, I'm going to lose That's my job. That's so sad, though. though. I'm saying, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, like, comparably to Daniel Jones, like, just a comparison, like, like you know, this third stringer that's not even on the active roster right now is in the practice squad like steps in and wins you football games like think about what that means for like how their, their decision making to start daniel jones from the, from day one well like how flawed that was like how yeah. they had a guy that was better but they were just throwing out daniel jones and losing because of what? like i've always said daniel jones had way too much privilege just based on his draft stock and contract they gave yeah, him everything did you see? Oh, they owed him did you see what in. Jordan Ronan posted about the stats between Daniel Jones and Desmond Ritter? Did you see yes. that? Desmond <laughs> yes. Ritter and Daniel Jones almost have identical stats. You know where Desmond Ritter is right now? He's not even on a fucking team. Mm -hmm. Out of the He's league. not even on a and team I, in the league, guys. And Daniel Jones is starting with the same stats. Like, where where are yeah. we? What, uni what I, reality are we in, man? What universe are we in that our GMs are literally freaking brain dead? Where are we? What What is this bullshit? What are the lies? What is the nonsense? Like, yeah, just I, total I, lies, dude. It's crazy. We are absolutely being tortured. As Giants fans, we are tortured. Yes. This is what torture feels like. I've seen a lot of people say, cut Daniel Jones. Let him go elsewhere so he can have success. He's not going to have success. Newsflash, guys. He fucking sucks. He's not going to have any success. <laughs> He's Desmond Ritter 2.0. Daniel Jones is not going to become a franchise quarterback at any point in his career. It is over. The experiment is done. Move on. I know that they aren't going to cut him midseason, but technically they can. They will save $750,000 against the salary cap if they want to cut him, which is why they cut Nick McLeod to save under a million dollars. So fuck it. Just do it. Get it over with. I'm so sick and tired of this shit, man. Anyway, we have a lot to discuss throughout this bye week. Uh, we'll continue to upload and have more reactions. And obviously when the official benching happens, because it's probably going to happen over this weekend, I would assume, or at least by Monday, Alex, we'll have our full reactions to that. And it's I might be popping bottles of champagne, dude. I might be getting really, really happy and excited. You guys might hear me hooting and hollering and screaming and just having the best time of my life when that news breaks on the reaction episode. So that's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait. Can't wait for Sunday. I'll be in SoFi Stadium. Go Bolts. Uh, but without further ado, we'll catch you on the next one. Have a good one, and also, let's go Giants.